All right, let's do this. Hello, everyone. Welcome, and thank you very, very much for joining us uh, on this virtual digital live conference for the launch of LMX and celebrating our legacy machines. This is a first for us. Uh, it's totally live. Nothing has been pre-recorded. So bear with us if it doesn't run absolutely smoothly. We would have much preferred to meet you in person, of course, to, to do this live uh, physically, but that is unfortunately not possible. You all know what situation the world is in right now. But again, we thought a virtual conference would be better than, than nothing at all. So bear with us once again if it doesn't run smoothly. Maximilian Busser will be presenting uh, in a few seconds. Just some housekeeping before that. Uh, we'll do about 30 minutes in total. The official launch time of the LMX is uh, 2 p.m., 1400 hours Central European time. So we'll try to end about then. We invite you to ask as many questions as you like during the presentation. You can do that, of course, via the comments in, in, on this YouTube channel. Now, to do that, of course, you do need to be connected via your own YouTube account. If you don't have a YouTube account, you're more than welcome to just participate and, and listen passively. But if you do want to ask questions, you will need to connect via your account. Um, at the end of the presentation, we'll be summing up those questions, and of course, Max will respond to those as well. All right, I guess that's it. Um, let me introduce the, uh, the founder, the owner, the creative director, the MB of MBNF, Maximilian Busser. Max, the virtual stage is yours. Thank you so much. Um, hello, everybody. It's great to have you here. Uh, I've had my share of uh, launches in the last 16 years, and there's always this big adrenaline rush and anxiety rush just when you go live. So uh, as Harris said, uh, I'll try and do as best as I can. He's told me I have to stop blabbering, I have to stop digressing. I have got like a really short time frame. So we'll go right into it. We're here for LMX. X means in our vocabulary, the 10th anniversary pieces. So 10 years ago, we launched LM1 and shocked everybody because MBNF, the guys who are doing the crazy 3D kinetic sculptures, HM1, 2, 3, and 4, come out with a round watch with white dials and Roman numerals. The story of that, and I've had a lot of questions over the last weeks because we've been announcing these 10th, this 10th anniversary, is um, LM1 was not at all supposed to be an LM. There was no idea of creating an LM. I mean, when I started MBNF, I definitely said I'm never going to do a round watch again. <laughs> so... You should always say, well, be careful of what you say. Um, it, we were on our 3D rebellion. But at some point, I started getting what I will call a balance wheel fetishism. It's completely legal. It's OK. <laughs> I, am, um, I fell in love with regulating systems, the escapement and the balance wheel. And on HM4, I'd managed to actually see it. And then I, was, I had this idea, I want to create an HM which has the balance wheel as a star. And whatever I designed, it was always as tubes, a tube with a balance wheel, a tube with the hours and minutes, a tube with the power reserve. And with my good friend, Eric Giraud, a super talented uh, independent uh, designer, whatever we did for months and months and months was either absolutely awful <laughs> or absolutely unwearable. And our level of frustration kept on going up. And one day in a meeting, I said, you know what? I mean, just, we're never going to manage this. And I sketched a round watch with, you know, like, let's, let's do a tribute. Let's do a tribute with two pocket watch dials and a, a flying balance wheel. And it's more or less, except for the power reserve, what became LM1. Now, I had no idea what the hell I was getting into. There was no LM2 planned. There was no any, anything planned. And it was just about trying to create something which was to say thank you to say thank you to all the great master watchmakers who enabled us 100, 200 years later to be where we are. The little issue I had was that my whole team didn't see it that way. <laughs> the pushback I got from everybody was gigantic. It's like, no, no, we are here in the rebellion with three, creating 3D kinetic art pieces. We're not here to create round watches. But as I pushed and pushed and pushed, and then we got Jean-François Mojon on board, and then we got Kari Voutilainen on board, I think the team slowly, slowly <laughs> was like, OK, let's do this. And um, 2011, we come out with the first legacy machine, the number one. What was amazing about it, the first ever flying balance wheel, which was the point of the whole process, the two independent time zones, 
I could finally go and travel in a place like, uh, like India, where you've got a half an hour time zone. And the vertical power reserve indicator, also because there was that whole 3D process around it. Uh, working with Jean-François as the engineer and Kari as the watchmaker uh, was amazing. I think, honestly, we can all thank Kari because he brought our brand to a completely different level of hand finishing. He, um, we learned so much and we brought the brand here thanks to him and we've stayed up here ever since. That's legacy one. While we're developing LM1, at some point I pitch Kari and Jean-François and saying, could we do it with two balance wheels? <laughs> and the reason to that is that in 1999, I will remember as if it was yesterday, I was still at Harry Winston, um, I was at a dinner and in front of me, the person who was a collector's dinner, and the, the person in front of me was wearing a small classic watch. And I couldn't see what it was. I said, excuse me, what is it? He says, it's a Dufour. I'm like, oh, a Philippe Dufour. I mean, uh, already today, it's pretty much amazing to see one, but in 99, it was incredibly rare. So I said, can I see it? And I thought it was a simplicity. And I turn it round and I see the two balance wheels and the differential. And my jaw dropped open. I will remember that day as if it was yesterday. And I remember thinking, wow, <laughs> uh, one day if I do something like this, I want to see those two balance wheels. It took 14 years, <laughs> 14 years from that encounter with the duality and coming up with Legacy 2. So that's uh, 2013. Then um, for the first and actually only time of my MBNF years, I started listening to my retail partners and to customers who said, your LM1 is fantastic but it's too big, it's too big, it's 44 millimeters, make it small. I thought, okay, I'm not just gonna make it small because people want it small, that absolutely goes against everything I'm trying to do at MBNF, but let's make it into a challenge. Let's try and keep this enormous flying balance wheel, which is 14 millimeters, and make it as small and thin as possible. That was LM101. We launched it, and also it was our first actually in an integrated movement that we created in-house. And we launched it in 2014. And guess what? Nobody wanted it. This was the worst sale of our history for many years, which actually told me again, I should never listen to the market. <laughs> but that actually changed. Just when we were about to stop LM101 because nobody wanted it, end of 2019, we came out with a little edition of palladium pieces with this beautiful bluish gray dial. 18 pieces, and they went, they all went out, like, oh. And then we did the LM101 with our friends from H. Moser, and the 60 pieces sold in four days. And suddenly everybody wants LM101s. Go figure, I will never understand what happens in the market. <laughs> That's LM101. From there comes the incredible LM Perpetual. Stephen McDonald's story, I mean, this is a whole other 30 minutes and Harris is gonna kill me if I go there. <laughs> but Stephen McDonald's story, he is, one of the greatest minds I've ever met. He, um, he's a uh, Oxford theology scholar living in Belfast who absolutely loves watchmaking and taught himself, an autodidact, I think you say. He taught himself watchmaking. And I met him in 2007. He helped me save the company. 2011, um, he, I hear he's in trouble. I go and see him and I say, how can I help you, Stephen? And he says, oh, I've got an idea for a perpetual calendar. And I'm like, no, no. And I've told this story many times. I'm like, I'm not going to do a perpetual calendar. They just don't work. And, uh, and he said, yeah, well, they don't work because boom, 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 boom. I'm like, yeah, but that's how all perpetuals function. He said, yeah, but that doesn't make any sense. Make it very short. Three and a half years later, all alone, Stephen, with the help of our team, um, is going to come out with a revolutionary movement, which is not only, I find, absolutely stunning to look at, it has so many revolutions and new ideas which have never been incorporated in watchmaking. Mm. And um, it has become a staple of, of our brand, and we will ever be grateful to Stephen. So that's the Perpetual. And during, while we're launching the Perpetual, we realized that there's so much to tell about this product that one of the main issues was never talked about. It was the first time a movement had the balance wheel on top and the escapement behind. Why? Because after three, four months of the beginning of his, of his process of developing the movement, Stephen comes to us and says, you know what? 
I don't have the space to put the escapement. Do you really want that flying balance wheel? I'm like, of course I want the flying balance wheel. Well, if I can't put the escapement, it's game over, I suppose. He said, ah, maybe not. He said, what do you mean, maybe not? I mean, for like hundreds of years, there is one thing you know that it's like Laurel and Hardy. <laughs> you need them one next to the other. You can't have them separate. So let's try. Again, because he was not taught watchmaking, he tries. And so we tried, and it actually worked. The balance wheel here, the escapement behind, incredible. Incredibly complex to machine, incredibly complex to engineer and to regulate, but it actually works. So from there, we trickle down to do the split escapement, and that was the, uh, therefore the fifth piece in the lineup. And, um, and then, of course, is the flying T. <laughs> the flying T is a whole other chapter. The, the watch I created for my wife, for my daughters, for my mom when she was still here. And um, that was um, probably the project where my team most wanted to kill me. They, <laughs> I drove them completely bananas because I had no idea what the hell I was doing. So I wanted for the first time of my life to create a watch for not only a women, a women, it was for the women in my life. And I have no idea how to do that. So I went all over the place. Oh, maybe we should do this. Maybe we should do that. So we started engineering. We stopped. We restarted something else. We start, And finally, I decided on that project. And um, was I terrified? As much as when HM1 came out, as much as when HM4 came out, I thought, oh my gosh, what have I done? And... Um, I'll always remember, because one of our, our greatest retail partners ordered very few at the launch during the SIHH, well, before the launch at the SIHH. And uh, during the evening of the launch, four or five months later, uh, they sold 11 pieces on the first evening, and they'd order like two or three. And the next day, I, I sat with them, and I said, oh, so, how come? And they looked at me and said, but women don't want thick watches. I mean, that's like two centimeters high. And we all know that women don't want complicated watches. It's a flying tourbillon. And I started laughing. I said, guys, I mean, you all know that men don't want spaceships on their wrists and, and cars and, and bulldogs and you name it. That's what we do. We create pieces. We have no idea if there's any market for it. We have no idea if anybody's actually going to like it. But we fall in love with our own products and then we see what happens. The same year, that was a crazy year, 2019, comes Thunderdome. So Thunderdome was in those days uh, 28 years in the making. That's a long time, 28 years. When I started at Jaeger LeCoultre in 1991 as a young product manager, there was a young watchmaker at the prototyping department called Eric Coudray. And we got along super well. And then, of course, I left after seven years. And I told him, one day we should do something together. And he said, yeah. Like we all say, yeah, let's do something. And, um, and so many, many, many years later, when he was finally free from all his obligations, I jumped on it and said, like, are we going to do something together? And he said, yeah, sure, let's do this. I said, look, Eric, I can, I can give you probably two things which most brands will not give you. The first, I'm going to tell you, do whatever you want as crazy as you want, don't, don't try and be uh, somebody who's rational. Do what you've you dreamt of. Do the craziest thing you've ever dreamt of. And the other thing is, I am going to um, give you space. I'm going to give you volume. Because all watches are more or less flat. I'm going to give you a dome. And you're going to be able to, to play with that. And so it became this insane thunder dome, the fastest and largest, which is completely anti, uh, uh, it, it's uh, counterintuitive. Um, the fastest and largest tri-axis regulator with the very first um, spherical uh, balance wheel. With the, he went to recapture the Potter escapement, etc., etc. There we go. Seven movements in uh, nine years. Eight years. And here we are. We're at LMX. The eighth caliber in ten years. So what do we going to do to celebrate those crazy 10 years. For me, it was important that I go back to the start, to the roots. It was to take LM1 and rework it completely. Put a, uh, as I was saying jokingly, it's LM1 on steroids. So what do we do? We create a fully new movement, as usual. It becomes the norm with us. And we start with three barrels instead of one barrel. So a seven-day power reserve instead of 
45 hours. And from there on top, everything is going 3D, much more 3D than before. Look at the dials. Instead of being flat, they're at 50 degrees. How with conical gears, that's something that we started on HM6 a long time ago and that we've actually perfected. And then, of course, you've got the escapement in front, which you see, which you will see in the film, working in front. And uh, at the back, you can see other wheels because I wanted to see more of the movement on the top. So you've got these beautifully hand-polished bridges with these beautiful red gold wheels, which are actually the minute wheels of the two time zones. Of course, the flying balance wheel, which is even higher. If you look at the way the regulator screws have been modified, they're actually, uh, how do you say, in French, maslot. They actually uh, help the watchmaker regulate much easier. So we redesigned that. Uh, of course, it had to be redesigned also because we had the three barrels. And if you turn the watch around, I'll take it in my hands here. You've got this amazing 3D contraption, which is a 3D power reserve indicator, but not only that, it's the first ever rotating power reserve indicator. So what is this? On one side, it's written one to seven, one to seven days. And on the other side, from Sunday to Monday, oh, sorry, Monday to Sunday. <laughs> and, um, and so what you do is once you've finished winding your watch up, a clutch opens up and you continue turning and the whole indicator is going to turn on itself. Isn't that cool? That's super cool. At the end of the day, you look at this piece. And for me, it's like a little city under a sapphire dome. You've got everything I love about watchmaking. You've got, of course, the, the regulator. You've got the 3D. You've got the conical gears. You've got... There, it's, it's, like, um, it's, like a, it's like an incredible mechanical painting in 3D on your wrist. Uh, we're super proud of ILMX. And um, the other thing I wanted to, to finish on is that we realized that we've created eight calibers of legacy machine in 10 years. That's amazing. But while we were doing that, we also created seven horological machine calibers. That is 15 calibers in 10 years. That is mind boggling. And, um, I just want to take this occasion to say thank you to my whole team and to everybody who's made that possible. Because honestly, up till a week ago when I actually realized that, I didn't realize the pressure, the stress, the insane amount of work I've put everybody through. And um, I'm humbled and I, uh, I feel a bit bad, actually. <laughs> I, feel, uh, um, that I feel maybe I've, I've pushed it too far. But uh, anyway, it's, it's been an incredible 10 years. And this LMX is just... A testimony of that. So now you guys, I'll let you see a little film and then we'll take your questions. Thank you very much, Max, for that presentation. Uh, as promised, we have a, a few questions. The first one goes back to something you were saying uh, at the very beginning of LM1, this uh, balance wheel fetishism you have. <laughs> Thanks for admitting that. Uh, the question is, what really, I mean, beyond that, what, what really brought about this idea of the flying balance wheel? What, what created that in your mind? So, um, actually, I realized that the trigger was a pocket watch I saw at the MIH, the, hmm. the Museum of Watchmaking in La chaux de -Fonds, when I visited. And I saw a pocket watch which had a balance wheel a little bit outside of the dial. 
So a few brands had already done like an opening on the dial where you can see the balance wheel. And this one was a little bit higher. And I can't remember, it was, it was not any specific watchmaker. Mm. And I remember looking at that going, wow, that is so cool. And I think that's what triggered it. It's while I was working on HM1, I think. Mm -hmm. And that sort of triggered it. HM1, HM2, HM3 were pretty standard movements in that case. HM4 then, you start showing it. Um, I, maybe in five years or 10 years, I'll realize it was something else. But I think that was the original idea. Thanks to that uh, ancient pocket watch there. Yeah. Second question, um, you talked about the uh, reaction internally, that there was some resistance at the team, but the question here is, what was the reaction, I guess meaning outside the market, the retailers, the clients, uh, to the first LM1 after those um, four horological machines you had presented before? Okay, um, it was very multiple. Uh, I will always remember the day I presented the piece to Kari himself yeah. during that 2011 Basel Fair, because he hadn't seen the watch fully assembled. He'd just seen the movement. And so I, I, we had just one office in those days. So I said, oh, Kari, come on, come, come. I took him from the HSI. We closed the door and I showed him the piece. And I will always remember, that was like one of the, the Hochpunkts, you said, high points of my, of my life at MBNF. He puts the watch on his wrist and he cracks up with this enormous smile. And he, he was like, he's not somebody who's, he was at least not in those days so outgoing. I was like, wow, this is incredible. <laughs> and, and he's looking at it and he's smiling. I was like, really, this is so beautiful. And, and he suddenly looks up at me and he says, uh, can we swap? I'm like, what do you, what do you mean, can you swap? Yeah, can, can we, uh, you, you take one of my 28 or 28 um, and I get one of these. And... This is 2011. I'm, I'm trying to make my mark in, in the watchmaking world. I'm not a watchmaker. Uh, it's true that uh, I'm an engineer, but I'm not a watchmaker. And when Kari tells you that, you sort of go, wow. we must have done something right. But it was not all everybody. Huh? I remember another great watchmaker I love, and I will not give his name, who came in and saw the piece and looked at it and said, it's a great watch, but I'm so disappointed with you. Hmm. Uh, and I was like, whoa, he said, like, not you. You're the guy who does the crazy stuff. Why are you going down that road? And that was like, oh, the same week I had two people I admire tell me that. And, um, but you realize that that's, that's who we are. Um, we generate strong emotions. And actually coming back to the first question, um, I think what's interesting is for a very long time, I've had a chip on my shoulder that I was not a watchmaker. And a lot of people in the domain love to remind me <laughs> that I'm not a watchmaker. And I, um, I realized that I would never have created LM1 if I had been a watchmaker. Yeah. Because the first, the first um, reaction of a watchmaker is to protect the escapement. So you want it inside, protected, and as small as possible so it goes at a higher speed of regulation. And, uh, and I decided I don't care. I want to see a really big balance wheel flying on top. I put the movement in jeopardy because I'm not a watchmaker. So I think all in all, it's probably today I'm, I'm happy I'm not a watchmaker. Well said. Another question, uh, I guess this is a very interested question, maybe from a collector. Will there be other final editions of legacy machines, like the final edition of LM1? Ah, no, never, <laughs> never. I made a massive error there. And uh, so we've done a few final editions of different models. Uh, and it made sense when I made that decision because typically, well, LM1, I decided we're going to stop LM1 because we have to make it uh, collectible. So we have to stop it. What I hadn't thought is that the man I'm going to be in five or 10 years will maybe enjoy going to rework mm. an older project because that's not the way I thought. I had never looked back. For 10 years, at the beginning of MBNF, it was all about looking forward, creating something amazing, which had never been done, taking out of, getting out of a comfort zone. And so the idea that I would one day go and take one of our older pieces and rework it never actually crossed my mind. By doing these final editions, I've stopped myself doing it. And um, no, so uh, honestly, there will maybe, we'll maybe stop. We probably will stop a certain amount of, of pieces, but we'll never call them final editions because like that, never say never again. Absolutely. 
Another question, uh, interesting one here. Um, how different is it creating an HM versus an LM? Oh, it's a completely different uh, mindset. HMs, I've often said, are my psychotherapy. They're my autobiography. I, I go and, I go and so basically in, in myself and my guts tell me I should go that way. There's absolutely nothing intellectual in it. It's raw. While legacy machines are um, very intellectual. They're my way of saying thank you. They're my way of revisiting the past. And so HMs come from here. And LMs come from there, even though of course, there is a lot of myself in an LM, but it's, it's much more rational in the way it's created. Understood. Uh, another question, which of the LMs was best received commercially and which one was, had the most critical reception? You partially responded to the second part of that question. but um, Interestingly, so I said the LM 101 uh, initially commercially just didn't work. Yep. And, uh, and again, that, that was a good lesson. Uh, and then now it's what everybody wants. And they're actually s selling for even premiums now, which is cool. Um, I think the same thing happened to the split escapement. Mm -hmm. uh, in the last couple of years, there have been few pieces sold. And I think what I'm understanding is that some of these simpler pieces need a longer life to be discovered. When, it, when it's a perpetual, uh, you've got, well, it's a Thunderdome, you've got the immediate wow effect yeah. and the customers are looking for that enormous spike of adrenaline, go for it. With a piece like a split escapement or a, a 101, it seems, I may be wrong, it seems that it's, um, it's a much uh, longer process. Um, so we'll see, whatever we do, we have no idea what's going to happen. Understood. Another question, how much time uh, did it take you and the team to design and develop this new caliber, meaning LMX? Uh, and when did you decide to create the LMX? So, uh, ooh, uh, I'll say about three years, something mm -hmm. like that. Um, it was, I mean, we had to rework everything because you've got a new balance wheel, new escapement, new uh, barrels, everything which goes with it. But of course, the, the thing is, we've developed a certain knowledge over the last 16 years. We know how to use conical gears. We know how to do a flying balance wheel. If I had started this project from scratch, it would probably have taken five or six years because we made massive errors and gone back. So, uh, yeah, it's about three years. Obviously, I'll be very honest. It wasn't created initially as an anniversary piece. Mm -hmm. It was a logical follow-up to the Flying T, the Thunderdome, and the next one. And at some point, again, because I never look at the dates and I really should do that more like, <laughs> oh, we've got an anniversary coming up and like, well, it makes sense. We've, we've actually, it's a piece which is inspired by LM1. Let's make it into an anniversary piece. Understood. I think we have maybe time for one more question. It's uh, 158. A very practical one. Uh, with these two dials, one dial always turns away from the wear while the other one is facing straight towards you. The question is, how does that wear in practice? You have to try it on. <laughs> so uh, this has actually been quite a challenge for us to make sure that you can actually read both dials very easily. The one which turns towards you makes complete sense. The one which turns a little bit outside, a little less. But you're going to see that for the first time, we put the MBNF on the dial at 3 o'clock. And we put an LMX on the dial at 9 o'clock. That's not what we usually do. We realized that if we didn't have those visual markers, the brain didn't know exactly where the 12 was anymore. Mm. So initially, we just put the MBNF, and then we realized that on the second dial, by actually, it's not that easy to know where the 12 is. And by just putting an LMX or anything else, I mean, just a, a, an inscription at 9, the brain translates it and knows where the 12 is. Um, I, I, we've made so many designs from the beginning of the different angles, how it was. This is 50 degrees from the center and 50 degrees like that. But it, we had so many iterations. Understood. We'll take one last question because it is 2 o'clock, but okay. we can go a little bit over. Um, the question is, for the Flying T, the impression was that this is one of the rare ladies' watches which men actually uh, are envious about. Uh, did you anticipate that? Uh, did that influence your decision, for example, for the Thunderdome? What happened ah. in that process? Um, again, Flying T, uh, as I said, I was t totally terrified. 
Um, I was terrified that women wouldn't like it. I was terrified that people would think that I'd sold out. Or, oh my gosh, he's doing something which for somebody else. And initially the Thunderdome didn't have that dial. The Thunderdome was a dome with this enormous three uh, axis or triple axis um, regulator. And I'd initially started designing it with um, like openings in the base plate with the hours and minutes. Yeah. And it was like a little bit digital. And actually Eric Coudre had started working on the whole engineering. And it just didn't look right. It was great because you had the whole sphere and nothing else, actually. But it, you didn't really read the time. It didn't look, it didn't look watchmaking. Mm. And uh, that's something which I find I love with our Thunderdome. By adding those wheels and those bridges, it looks even more watchmaking. And, um, and then while we were working on, on Flying T, one day I said, you know what, let's just use the same concept of the dial of the Flying T. So I went back to Eric Coudray and said, look, we, instead of having those openings, we would like the dial like that. I thought he was going to kill me. <laughs> because, of course, he'd already started the whole engineering. That changes the whole engineering of the movement. Of, instead of having your hours, minutes there, you've got it there. Conical gears and so on. And so, and so, um, so yeah, it was, it's the flying T which influenced the Thunderdome and actually, therefore, influenced this. Um, they're, they're, they're creative veins you, 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 you tap onto. You create something and then you realize you want to explore it. I think all uh, artists, I, don't, I won't call myself an artist, but all artists do that. And here clearly I, I am in the middle of something, <laughs> of trying to do something with these 3D uh, dials. Um, they give me so much more um, possibilities which flat dials don't enable me. Good to know you're in your inclined dial phase then, Max. Uh, we'll leave it there. Uh, the launch is, is basically live now, at least I hope so. Uh, thank you very, very much once again for joining us. The other questions which we did not get around to, we will respond in writing on the comments. So sorry about that, but look forward to the answers. Max, I'll leave the final goodbye to you, but thanks again for joining us. Thank you, everybody. 10th anniversary, uh, like every anniversary, means so much. And again, um, we wouldn't be here without all of you guys. So thank you. See you soon.